burning 10 million years of fossil sunlight in a few hundred years. And what does that mean for the coming century? That is a conversation that our society is not having. And I refer to that as energy blindness. In de serie Tegenlicht Toekomstverkenners gaan we met tien inspirerende denkers op zoek naar sporen van de toekomst. Dit is de toekomst van Nate Hagens, hoofd van het Institute for the Study of Energy and Our Future. En bedenker van de podcastserie The Great Simplification. We have spent the last century harnessing enormous amounts of fossil energy to build a world of complexity like nothing seen before. Hagens, die werkte in de financiële wereld, realiseerde zich dat de toekomst maar om één ding draait. Toegang tot goedkope energie. All of a sudden we started this, this little bit of growth and then it was like a moonshot growth. I um, mean, the last hundred years have never been experienced in, in human history, not, not even close. And so over time, people that were trying to explain what happened, they credited it to technology and human ingenuity. And they gradually left energy as just its cost share input. This product requires $100 of inputs and $6 of energy, so it's only 6% of the input, when it's really 98% of the value added. Because technology without energy is a sculpture. A human body without energy is a corpse. A city without energy is a museum. Everything we invent requires energy, materials, and technology. But if you just focus on the technology and you forget about the energy, you're, you're missing the thing that animates it, that delivers it, that maintains it, that invents, creates, manufactures everything. So I, I think over time, we were so successful that that success felt like well, it's because we're so freaking clever and we can invent our way out of everything and we are clever, but we're not being so wise because we are drawing down this bank account and treating it as if it were interest. We really have no conception of how the entire edifice of human civilization is underpinned by energy, primarily fossil energy. Um, so I think when I say energy blindness, I mean generally our culture's complete ignorance about how important energy is to our lives. This is our horse Rocky. He's a draft horse. People used to use draft horses to do labor. Uh, this utility vehicle with a little bit of uh, gasoline can do the work of 45 Rockies uh, for a few dollars. And this is kind of the story of industrialization is we have substituted human physical labor and animal labor with machines. These machines run on fossil carbon uh, which is finite and is incredibly powerful. So all the things in our world are machines powered on fossil sunlight, which can do amazingly powerful, fast, strong things relative to draft animals. We are living off of ancient sunlight that is incredibly powerful for what it does to us. A barrel of oil does five years of my physical work and we pay 70 euros uh, for that. Humans currently in our global economy use 100 billion barrel of oil equivalents. If you add up coal, oil, and natural gas and you turn them into oil equivalents, we use 100 billion barrels, okay? If each one is worth five years of my physical labor, we're in effect pulling from the ground 500 billion worker equivalents and adding them to the global system where there's around 5 billion real human workers 
doing physical work. That is not unlimited. It is a bank account that we're drawing down 10 million times faster than it was trickle charged by the daily photosynthesis of ancient algae and phytoplankton in the oceans that died and went to the bottom and were formed into oil. So it's depleting. Uh, that's the second point. And then the third point is we are energy blind about the differences between different types of energy, uh, energy properties, energy fungibility. When people say, oh, uh, we have this bad energy, coal, because it has emissions, let's just replace it with a good energy like a wind turbine. But each type of energy has different sorts of chemical, spatial, density, environmental uh, properties. Um, and we are, are ignorant to that. Humans generally, and I think this is because of our economic textbooks and economic theories, treat a dollar worth of energy as a dollar worth of gumballs uh, or blankets or anything like that. But energy has massively more impact in our economies. And we haven't had to think that way because the last 120 years, with the exception of recessions, we've had more energy available to the human system than we did the year before. So we are swimming in a sea of energy without recognizing the magnitude of what it does for us, which is why the Ukraine-Russia situation um, has woken people up to this energy situation, especially in Europe. Um, so that's a tragedy, but in some ways it's a good thing because suddenly people are saying, oh my gosh, what do we do without this natural gas, which we just assumed would be coming indefinitely. And so in that sense, energy is the master, especially oil, is the master resource. Um, you can print money, but you can't print energy. You can only extract the energy faster. Energy is the currency of life. Energy has allowed organisms and animals to have advantages throughout history. And it's like we happened upon this giant prize of fossil hydrocarbons and we've been throwing a party for the last 150 years. And unfortunately, most of it has been wasted. We haven't used it for anything long lasting, for sustainable, meaningful civilization. It's like we've turned the world kind of into metaphorical casino uh, junket. <laughs> Right now we're using renewable energy with subsidies and rule changes and um, financial guarantees and things like that to continue this level of 19 terawatt global human consumption. Renewable energy is the right answer to the wrong question. The way it is promoted has any chance of working. This net zero by 2050, total fairy tale. I mean, think about that. Net zero emissions by 2050. I mean, our entire civilization is based on carbon. Renewable energy, first of all, isn't renewable. We have to rebuild it every 20 or 30 years. Um, second of all, it has different energy properties. It is intermittent. The sun is shining, then it's not. The wind is blowing, then it's not. And relative to human demand that follows a daily sine wave curve, renewable energy is not a good match with that demand. Sometimes we have way too much energy and other times we have none. Uh -huh. So we either need to run that in tandem with natural gas where we flick a switch and turn it on uh, or nuclear or coal or something like that, or we need to store it with batteries. And there's an argument about how much batteries you need, uh, how much uh, uh, buffer you need. Some people think we need a month, other thinks only two days. 
But no matter which you choose, if we're to get rid of fossil fuels and go to renewable energy, we will need hundreds of times the current amount of solar and wind. And if we need hundreds, where does the copper and the lithium and the vanadium and the nickel and the cobalt and all those minerals come from to scale it up to that level? That's a real problem. And not only that, but renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal, etc., only generates electricity. Mm-hmm. Electricity is only 20% of the global energy mix. The rest is transportation fuels and heat and things like that. So some things can be switched to use electricity. And electri- turning uh, um, electrons into electricity is much more efficient than burning fossil fuels in an engine. Yeah. So there, that's a really good thing. But ultimately, it comes down to cost. And the cost of a renewable energy society will be much, much higher than just pulling this fossil stuff out of the ground. Um, writ large. So we can use renewable energy. It can power a great civilization, just not this one. Not the one that we currently have with the six continent global just in time supply chain and flights, thousands of flights in the air at any one time and 1500 mile uh, supply chain for the average uh, hamburger in the United States. That sort of thing can't be powered with current renewable energy. How are we going to culturally um, adapt to perhaps less energy workers uh, and use our remaining energy workers to uh, combine with technology like solar or geothermal or wind towards some uh, more stable uh, system? We have underpaid for the main input to our economy for the last century. If we paid the real price, which would be the cost of creation, not just the cost of extraction, or the cost of pollution and externalities, there would not be a single industry in the world that would be profitable today. As we grow, we get more interaction with other people and we meet people and we fly and go to meetings and the entire system expands in a uh, exponential way. And so as we're growing, the complexity increases. All the relationships and the nodes and the transportation vectors, and that only happens because we have cheap and available energy. I believe that the downside or the flip side or the mirror uh, uh, side of this upswing of the carbon pulse is going to be a reduction in complexity. And it will probably be, in my opinion, the greatest event ever faced by our species. And I call it the great simplification. And that will happen in the 21st century, um, where we all of the things that we've built on the upslope of the carbon pulse will have to decomplexify more local supply chains, less energy services to the average human. Um, and I think reducing complexity is what we need to do now, but it's complex to tell that to people, to tell that to politicians. There's no easy way to do that. We didn't evolve to handle this amount of complexity and this amount of Uh, toxicity. This is scary stuff to tell this whole story. So partially we like simple stories that we can understand, um, which is why when most people hear this story about energy blindness and climate change and, um, you know, the meta crisis and all this, we typically respond like, no, humans are clever. We've solved these things before. There's no problem. We're going to colonize Mars. Or, oh my God, that's terrible. It's going to be Mad Max future. And the human brain, it, we don't like to feel uncertain. So we choose one of those paths. Because if we had to think about the complexity of our system every day, 
it would slow down our, our behaviors every day. We couldn't make decisions in our normal life that, that we need to do to feed the kids and go to our job. So we end up hearing information and we parse it into one of these camps. We rarely fly up high enough and look down how energy and materials and money and human behavior and the environment all form parts and processes of the human ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And there is a story that combines everything, the ecology of humans and the planet and our economic systems, and everything is connected. So my view is I've spent 20 years trying to connect the dots uh, of these things. And I think we have to fly up high enough and look down at the, the game board. We need a generalist view to then inform uh, the experts. So I think systems thinking on how the parts and processes fit together, interrelate and create emergent uh, a phenomenon that you wouldn't be able to predict by just looking at one piece mm -hmm. is really critical at this stage of where we face ourselves. Everything ultimately will come down to governance. Humans, for a very long time, have been problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And when we solve a problem, uh, we add complexity to a system. Uh, that complexity requires energy. And if you look at aerial views of transportation uh, systems in cities or a nighttime view of uh, the sky and the world, all of the different vectors require energy to transport goods and services. So as we build complexity, the nodes of the system all of them require energy inputs. So as we head to a world with less energy, our complexity by definition will have to simplify. Governance is what will make or break uh, our futures. And so I'm hopeful that the people in leadership positions start to think systemically. Um, I, I think without that, we're, we're lost. We have to look at how the whole system fits together. Yeah. And for now, money provides optionality. If you have more money as a person, as a, a corporation, or as a country, you can then buy things that you need because money can instantly be turned into other things. Yeah. But as we simplify, that may not be the case. Um, the correct thing to do for a country right now is to start to reduce the complexity, which would in turn reduce the risk, um, start producing more goods locally, start shrinking your supply chains instead of China and Canada, it would be Amsterdam and Holland and Germany with, with key goods. That makes sense. That's more sustainable. That's more resilient but it will mean less, more, more costs and less economic benefits. So in the near term, people won't choose that. If a country chooses to simplify first, it will be outcompeted by other countries that still play the economic growth game. And yet, like the tortoise and hare example, maybe the countries that simplify first will have an advantage. Mm -hmm. And I do think Europe, uh, probably will simplify before the United States does because of the United States has 95% of its own energy, 93% of its own energy. Yeah. Um, so is that a blessing or a curse for Europe? Uh, we, we're gonna see. Increasingly, I no longer talk about solutions because I don't think there are any solutions to what we face. I think we face a predicament, not a problem. A problem has a discrete solution. I prefer to think of responses. There are a million or more responses to the situation we face. Most of the energy and wealth and consumption and goodies that we have 
at the end of the day, really aren't making us happier or healthier. But we have them, so we use them, and we continue to. If you think about the top five or top ten things that bring you joy in your life, my dogs, sitting meditating with my chickens, seeing a deep, dark, green, lush, damp forest, seeing animals in nature and seeing them in their own surroundings, having a group of friends where I'm playing cards and having some beer and cracking jokes, uh, love with a partner, um, being with a team of people that are working on something really meaningful. You know, these are the things that will still exist after energy descent. These are the things that really matter to humans. So it's already starting to culturally change. Young kids are trying, are starting to value things like experiences rather than stuff. Wait till we get to a point where having wealth and having fast cars and fancy clothes, wait until that's a negative status symbol. Right now it's still a status symbol, but wait until people want like normal things and that's when farmers growing the best tomatoes, that gives you status rather than having a shopping center development. Maybe that day is around the corner, I don't know.